Welcome to this ATI Community of Practice meeting um, November. It's really, really great to have you here. And we actually have um, Open Up talking to us this time around. So I'm really excited because if you came along to Tic Tac, you would have seen Sean presenting about um, impact measurements. And this kind of inspired us now that we are starting to think about Tic Tac 2025 and we should be releasing our save the dates this week, right, Gemma? Um, we were thinking about how much we would really like more access to information um, work and impact, specifically impact based on access to information work on the schedule at Tic Tac. So we asked Open Up to do um, this workshop for us to kind of give us all a bit of food for thought about how to think about impact, especially in relation to things like campaigning work and um, media work. And then hopefully we'll see some of you guys um, presenting at Tic Tac in June. Mm. So I will hand over to Gabby, who is going to do a presentation for us. Thank you so much. Yay! <laughs> Hi everyone, and thanks so much for hosting us. Let me know if anybody can, if I drop out, but I think the internet will be fine, and as long as we can hear and we can see my presentation. Okay, terrific. Um, And I'll be talking uh, hopefully for like 30 minutes, Um, and uh, hopefully with nice slides, because I redid them, um, and I didn't let the graphic designer see them. Um, so you get you get what you sign up for. Um, but I'll be talking a little bit about impact measurement. And so Open Up have been around for like a decade. Um, and we've, well, obviously in that 10 years, I've, you know, gathered a lot of experience in like monitoring, evaluation and research. Um, really part of the most significant experience we have for informing our impact monitoring is the experience of being a data-driven organization with embedded data practices that have helped us to build up, you know, our, our impact metrics and these kinds of things. And really, I don't think you can talk about impact monitoring without thinking about, you know, how you manage data within your own organization and aligning them accordingly. Um, and so that, informs a lot of how we approach these things and of course like impact monitoring is kind of you know it's just another version of monitoring evaluation research and learning it's just another version of all those log frames that you've had to do a million times for different funders and and the language shifts you know according um to the environment but we've tried to develop very practical ways uh to think about what your impact looks like, particularly in a transparency environment, you know, an access to information environment. And, and you know, I I used to run an organization that focused primarily on access to information laws and implementation. And so I can also give specific uh, input on that if anybody needs, uh, if anybody would like to discuss those things later, but um, this is will be reflecting a bit more on impact. Um, so just at a high level, you know, the simple way to embed this stuff is to lead from your goals, create a framework, move a measure and communicate. Because actually at its most fundamental, well, no, not at its most fundamental, a real bonus of like con consistent and good impact monitoring is then having impact that can be communicated effectively. Um, and so communication should be a part of how you think about this whole process. Um, and we'd like to start usually with a story, um, which is how Sean started his Tic Tac as well, um, which is the ever guilt inducing question uh, that my co-founder used to yell at people every time they um, messed up a project, <laughs> which was, why do we not just feed a hungry child? Um, and I mean, it, it makes you feel terrible, but you know, there are, I think sometimes, um, reflecting quite honestly on how we are spending money and what we're spending money on, isn't the ultimate measure of whether we're making impact or not, but can help contextualize for us sometimes, you know, uh, how we should or shouldn't be moving. 
Um, you know, we're hoping, of course, that it, especially in the both the transparency space and the innovation space, um, you know, it's it's sometimes hard uh, contextualizing for other groups what impact is because we're so facilitative. So because we are often at the intersection of, you know, working across sectors, because we're often aiding other people in, you know, improving their impact, I think um, impact can be more challenging for us to to demonstrate, well, to talk about, maybe not to demonstrate, because I think there are ways you can demonstrate it. But, you know, the transparency related work is so important um, because of both how it contributes to more systemic change um, uh, as opposed to just not just, but like as opposed to poverty alleviation activities um, and often has both indirect and direct impacts. And so the task becomes learning how we capture uh, both of those kinds of impact. Um, and it allows us to objectively reflect on our own progress and how much we're contributing um, to the spaces that we're in. Um, and quite simply, you know, we all want to be doing good in the world um, and we need to be knowing that we're doing good in the world. We need to be trying to improve our own impact and that good that we're doing. And we need to be able to market that impact in order to carry on doing the kind of good that we want to do. Uh, so do more good. Um, so in terms of at a high level, trying to lead from your goals, uh, we've used impact statements frequently as it's kind of somewhere in between an outcome and an objective. Um, just as sometimes a simple method for uh, defining the kind of impact we want to see. And so, for instance, these are the impact statements we use as uh, for our citizen engagement program. And you'll see that these impact statements all lead from our vision. Um, so the vision is a South Africa where citizens and governments are empowered to thrive collaboratively. And then we have both environmental impacts which we consider like, which are sort of ecosystem impacts or, or indirect impacts that we want, that we feel are vital. Um, but simultaneously the impacts, the impact statements in the different metrics that all categories of stakeholders that we want to engage with. And so part of what are, the utility of an impact statement, so something as generic as saying to yourself, having a statement that links the value and the vision of what you want to do ultimately to, to you know, the outcomes um, that you're working on and having it as generic a statement as something like um, citizens can enact positive forms of social pressure. The nice thing about impact statements is if you have clarity on your impact statements, so I want to create positive, enact positive forms of social pressure, it allows you to more easily think about what both qualitative and quantitative indicators for that might look like, and opens up a slightly more creative way of thinking of that often than your straightforward log fr frames might do. Um, but some, just some broad notes and goals, um, thinking about your high level impact, so the ultimate impact you want to make, um, is should obviously be based on your theory of change. And one thing we found very useful is, is when you're unpacking your theory of change, in other words, what is it that you do that creates the, the social good or the social impact that you want to see, is that visualizing that is frequently very helpful. Um, but it's essentially this, it's, it's the same as, you know, creating your own hypothesis, your organizational hypothesis. And, you know, making that very simple and clear. And then all your impact statements, your indicator, your outcomes, your outputs, no matter what the log frame is you're having to uh, look at, these should all um, stem from there. Um, and that's how you remain value-driven, 
you know, in your implementation. It is useful also to think about how your high level goals link to other goals. Um, and that's admittedly more of a communication exercise. But, you know, I think thinking about how your high level goals relate to stuff like the sustainable development goals or and South African our national development planning goals. It uh, gives you a whole nother language with it in which to communicate your own progress and, and is very useful. Um, thinking about transparency in particular, um, I think um, it's really important to always be sure that we, when we're unpacking impact in the space, we, we are very clear that transparency and accountability are not equate, equatable. I know you all know this very, very well. Um, but you know something something you often see in in theories of or, you know more weakly framed theories of change or weakly framed impact um, monitoring tools mm. is just increasing access to information doesn't necessarily increase accountability. And you can have access to information activities that aren't related to accountability, of course. Um, and don't seek to relate to accountability, but we need to be sure that we we keep those those languages clear from each other. And just to like really oversimplify the point, you know, we think about so Vulakamali is our open budget portal, is the South African open budget portal. Uh, we built that alongside National Treasury, an amazing portal, makes all our financial or management. Um, but largely budgeting more than other kinds of financial management information openly available has helped us be number one on the open budget index. But South Africa obviously already has has significant accountability challenges in relation to um, uh, corruption and those kinds of things. And I think it's a pretty simple way of acknowledging that transparency and accountability aren't brethren. And one of the simple ways we've used, um, just like we use those sort of impact statements as a simplified way of stating what it is we seek to do, uh, we also use this like a little moniker quite um, often in our work, um, which is to inform, empower, activate. And so those to us are the different steps of um creating impact in a civic tech environment. So, and we usually use different measures um, to, to um, um, unpack progress uh, across these three areas. Um, and these little monikers are, are, you know, might seem trite, but they're actually really useful um, for designing your impact monitoring strategies. So what do we do next? We know what our high level goals are. We move on to creating a framework. Um, and this is where, you know, you start to do things that look a bit more like a <laughs> frame. Um, and, you know, they're different. I know like um, there are contexts which use like, oh, what do they call results and activities in the in these different kinds of things, but we generally just break our, our impact monitoring down into activities, outputs, and outcomes. And outcomes and impacts are not necessarily the same. As you saw, our impact statements are simpler and somewhat higher level. Um, but our outcomes are, are sort of what has been achieved through our interventions. I find these questions every time I'm trying to figure out the difference between an activity and output and an outcome is very useful. Um, so an activity is what you did and and you want to track your activities, um, obviously, um, you know, because and relate that to also to expenditure to monitor progress. So that'll be, you know, we hosted two workshops. We had 500 attendees. Uh, your output is how well did it work? So what have we produced? Um, and you can say we produced, uh, you know, successfully 60% of, of people uh, completed our workshop. So that's the output. But the outcome was what was achieved. And that's that people were capacitated to uh, in relation to digital skills and felt empowered. There's my inform and power activate our little cohort um, to act on that. 
Um, and what a next stage impact might be would be learning two months later that um, that participant then used that new, say, uh, FOIA-related skill to access a document uh, from whatever local government agency you have. And that, that to me, would be an impact. But outcomes and impacts are uh, close brethren. Um, user metrics are, are not really equatable to impact. Um, and we have a nice case study that I'll get to if I speed up about uh, why that is. Um, but it is obviously a lot of those, you know, analytics and user metrics are very tempting um, to try and use as impact measures. Um, but frequently impact is more about your story of achievement um, than, than your just your quantitative data from user analytics. Um, so simply your outputs are not your outcomes. Um, and in order to measure your outcomes, so in other words, going back, what was achieved, you need to measure the difference between one thing and another. And that's why in any impact monitoring exercise, forming your baseline is such an important um, part of, of your impact monitoring activities. Um, because really impact is about monitoring change and change is difference. Um, and so your baseline is is very fundamental. Um, so this is just a shorthand on how to construct outcomes. Um, you you describe the change in what for whom, and then you'll obviously also you know how um, in more traditional monitoring, evaluation, research, and learning activities, you try and make your um, outcomes uh, smart, so specific, measurable, achievable relevant and time bound, but uh, this is a, a sort of more simple way of constructing your income outcomes, sorry, income. <laughs> so you'd say we improve school results for teen girls in the Western Cape, or we reduce unemployment for people below the age of 18, I ran out of space in Matsikama, or we expand effective FOI processes in rural CBOs. And that's a simple way of constructing your income outcomes. Another useful thing for thinking about when you're trying to describe your own outcome is to think about how you're doing this better than other people or how you're simplifying this process compared to other people or other organizations or other entities for trying to consider for yourself what your impact is. Because like I said, your impact monitoring is in part, you know, about communicating what you're doing, but it's also about trying to improve what you're doing. And I think sometimes being very reflective of how could we be doing this better? Uh, are we doing this simply enough, effectively enough, cost-effectively enough, et cetera, um, is, is important. So, a big thing in impact statements and impact monitoring is, you know, establishing a nexus. So in other words, what, how can you say that what happened is because of what you did? And that's, you know, often challenging um, when you're trying to get more high level impacts. You know, I can tell you how many people attended my workshop, um, but it's very difficult for me to tell you if that conference I hosted in 2017 led to the higher efficiency of FOIA requests in the Western Cape region in, in 2024. Um, and so establishing a nexus is a challenging part of the work, but you can also see when you're trying to get to that attribution, um, why storytelling is so useful. Um, but one of the way, simple way, mechanisms for try, thinking about that is to think about what happens when you leave. Um, and so, you know, we have a lot of legacy projects, um, transparency projects. One of them is our medicines pricing register, for instance. Another of them is um, Muni Money, which isn't a legacy project. We still work on it collaboratively with government. And sometimes the best clue about how well you're doing 
is to uh, is revealed when when you stop doing it. So we had a block in service. I don't know what happened over the weekend. Um, and to Mooney Money, and um, uh, were on Saturday night received an email from someone at Cornell University um, explaining how great they think it is and would we mind turning it back on. Um, so, you know, I think, you know, understanding how essential or not essential you are is, is very useful for describing impact. And then understanding how to communicate these kinds of things to an external audience matters too. Um, so, you know, part of the big challenge um, in this attribution ne attribution nexus is how to, you know, um, bring your outcomes. So obviously it's easy to control your outputs, um, but as we move more to outcomes, um, your ability to directly influence your outcomes um, becomes more challenging. And the goal is to bring your outcomes more to within your influence and also the description of your influence. So moving on to the practicalities of, of how to do this in an organization. Um, and, and, you know, as I mentioned, one of the most important things is establishing your baseline. Um, also establishing a control. So figuring out what happens in a community when you're not there um, is is very useful for for um, you know uh, understanding uh, being able to establishing that nexus um, and obviously you need to be collecting data and you need to be collecting it consistently. One thing that is there are a lot of different ways you can um, collect data, um, but you know I think we, you also need to prioritize this within your own organization's capacity and resources. Um, and there are differences in how easy certain kinds of data are to collect versus how relevant they might be to determining impact. And I think having an objective view of how that works within your own organization is important for establishing your own impact monitoring plan. Um, and I, here you'll see a couple of examples uh, of the different kinds of uh, data sources uh, that might be useful um, and how useful or not relevant or not relevant to impact they might be. Um, Okay, so moving on to communication um, and appreciating that your impact data is a strategic asset for your organization. Uh, how you communicate your results matters. Um, the golden rule is one killer outcome a slide, <laughs> but that's for a pitch deck. Um, and later on, you can get there, we have a, a QR code which links to an impact catalog that open up have developed for ourselves and you can see the how we've um, scheduled up uh, our impacts uh, metrics for different projects uh, that might be useful um, your communication on your impact goal should link to your organizational goals um, and I think in thinking about that and thinking about the segmentation of your audiences you should reflect on how you can communicate impact for a different kind of audience um, using a different kind of language. Um, and so for instance, uh, we've been building up our knowledge on the SDG indicators, um, you know, obviously keeping our, our internal impact strategy the same, but um, figuring out how to relate our own impact indicators to SDG impact indicators because we found with the business community um, and as we try and build up our corporate social responsibility funds that that's a language that resonates with that kind of org audience. Uh, and similarly, you know, figuring out sustainability of our different projects and our different initiatives um, is of relevance for different kinds of investors, which includes funders. 
Um, but again, you don't change your impact indicators. You just change how you communicate those results. Mm. So I'll give an example of what we were talking about earlier when we were saying how user me metrics don't equate with impact. Um, one case study starts with the quiz. And that's how many users do tools need to have for transparency impact? And the answer is one. So we did a project with a journalist called Raymond Joseph, who was the main uh, utilizer of a tool that we developed. Um, the SA Lotteries tool consolidated scraped open lotteries data. Um, and using that tool, because he needed it because of you know, simplifying access to that, the lotteries information, Array broke a major story on corruption in the lotteries scandal. Um, yeah, I'm not saying that very well, sorry. Um, the tool was actually, I say just one, but that's for, you know, dramatic effect. The tool was also used by the special investigating unit itself um, in, in its own investigations in relation to lotteries, uh, lotteries corruption. But it revealed 2 billion rands worth of, uh, of uh, fraud and a few hundred million rands have been recovered by the Special Investigating Unit um, based on Ray's reporting and based on the utilization of that tool. Um, so again, um, you know, if we focus just on outputs and even to a degree on outcomes, I suppose, you know, because sometimes people will say an indicator uh, of a tool's effectiveness is the amount of users who've used it. Um, we, you know, I think you miss a huge story. Um, what makes the tool important is the impact it had. Um, and so I think sometimes appreciating that um, impact monitoring is really storytelling um, allows you to, you know, create a more both flexible and responsive um, approach to your own impact monitoring. So there is a QR code to our your our impact catalog. Um, and I thought now we could open up the floor to any questions. If you're looking at journalistic stories and applying this to those kind of like media type FOI uses, how do you track the impact because that's a bit more like the the conference side of things like how do you know what is the impact related to that story yeah I mean so that's a, it's establishing that nexus is often tricky but like also I think what is quite nice there is a lot more forgiveness in the impact monitoring space about you know how rigid that nexus needs to be I think then you get in other spaces which is quite nice um but I do think I mean you know one of the traditional metrics on for in media and journalism is also looking at what's it like circulation cost and spend so there are ways that you can you know get a generic assessment of how of can't remember what it's called advertising spend or you know as as another as like a proxy indicator for how successful a story has been um and that is kind of I think that is those kinds of metrics are useful when the impact you are trying to drive is say um narrative influence right so if your goal is to build capacity in journalists to tell climate stories so for instance, that's a goal we want to like build their capacity and um, to tell climate stories because we believe that increased exposure to climate stories will lead to, you know, eventually to better climate outcomes. And then I think, you know, the 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 sort of can't remember what it's called, <laughs> but you know what I mean, like the the cost, uh, you know, the 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 advertising cost or influence of that story is relevant. And that's if, if it's a narrative change. But if it's about, uh, you know, um, influencing journalists lead to greater accountability, which is also where the transparency and accountability nexus 
um, comes in. Measuring that accountability is very hard. I mean, unless you can get the SIU, like in this case, <laughs> to actually use a tool or to say or to acknowledge that, you know, their investigating of the story was related to a news story. You know, are there, I think there are a lot of challenges in the traditional activities that have sought to use media as an accountability mechanism because it's really difficult actually, or, or not necessarily, but it's more challenging to um, make that connection um, than we're sometimes honest about. Um, but there are ways to do it. Again, it depends on what you're trying to monitor and the, the ultimate impact you're trying to have, I think. Hmm. Trying to think of a nice boy-related story in particular. I mean, one of the nice thing about FOIA activities is, you know, if the goal that that transparency to accountability nexus can be a little bit, mm, and but again, you often, you know, like you'll have success in a, a FOIA application. It's used in a media story. How that media story <laughs> leads to accountability is. Another thing, but not every activity needs to be an accountability activity. And transparency is an important end in and of itself, you know. Um, uh, we also, I think there's interesting work that could be done in, in you know, also trying to um, monitor and improve efficacy in the FOIA process itself. And there are a lot of ways that you can um, measure that. Do you know what I mean? Which includes creating controls through, you know, like um, how long did it take you to complete the request uh, versus how long it takes you now or how long it takes a user to get a response. Also looking at, you know, how different kinds of language might influence uh, productivity of a request. Um, you know, I think there are a lot of uh, very useful quantitative measures for exploring FOIA projects, which we sometimes guilty of not not using um, to their full advantage. You spoke about using FOI um, requests in media. There's there's two spaces where I see it used more directly without kind of out good outcomes, or, or, or you can you can get a, a more direct nexus, and that's in kind of activism, where people force politicians to make or not make certain decisions uh, based on information that was 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 gathered through that process and then kind of legal action as well where that information that was unearthed is used very directly in a in a court case for whatever which can also kind of overlap a lot with activism so you know media is very very important but sometimes you don't you don't see the outcomes or the impact that you really want to but there, there's also activism and, and legal action that I've seen as stuff being used. Thinking about, because so we we are currently doing um, and have been for about a year, some work with marginalized groups in the UK. And our theory is that like with better use of FOI, these groups will be able to like make better campaigns and push for better policy change. But looking at the way, like the policy landscape works in the UK, I'm not sure how we can prove that it was our teaching and use of FOI that has helped push that policy change. Like, do you have any kind of advice on what sort of things we might be looking at in that respect? So you, it's not just about, I mean, because obviously user perception stuff is really important and tells, particularly in the empowerment space, which is also why, you know, doing your baseline or whatever. But in, in, in understanding, so you want to create, so the, so, so you, it's not just about empowering people to use the FOIA better, but the theory is then if they are more empowered to use that effectively, it will improve the policy end. Or do you mean policy end or response like the supply end? 
really. So not just a change in policy, a change in practice. Yeah, I, mean, I guess, yeah, the outcome would eventually be a change of practice. But I think that, like, the way that it, it would fall out would take so long that mm. I'm sure that we'd still be able to, like, we wouldn't be able to report on it within the lifetime of the project. But the, like, pushing policy through um, side of things probably can be reported on within the lifetime mm -hmm. of the project, hopefully. Yeah. I mean, so there'd be the capacity building side of things, you know, so I know the user perception side. So I feel empowered. Um, and then the kind of activation side, they've made several requests and responses have been received or, or not received. Um, I've been interested in quite some time and we, I, I actually, I'll try and find you we did a quantitative um, report. It was quite interesting on on how the differences in how how res in responses to different kinds of language. It was a small sample, but like how using different kinds of like language and in requests influenced results. Um, uh, but it, it it's a small sample, but it's interesting. I find it an interesting kind of research. Um, and what was found is that when people used what we termed, she termed it as more aggressive and I termed it as legalistic, which <laughs> shows you how people think about lawyers. I was hurt. But anyway, um, that, that there were better responses to legalistic language, which isn't a surprise, but is really important for thinking about empowerment and also thinking about the kinds of, so you can train people in a certain way but are there forms of automation, you know, that could help people overcome these barriers that come from how particular kinds of people are responded to when you know who your audience is? You know, that's really anyway, I'll find the research piece is basically what I'm saying. But, you know, doing those, and again, that links to control, you know, thinking about um, sometimes just even if you can't tell the story of impact or you can tell it more generically, as long as you can tell a story of influence, that's also useful, you know, um, and thinking creatively about that. Uh, let's try and find that. Oh, Rachel's got her hand out. Rachel, do you want to jump in? Yeah, thanks. Uh, well, firstly, thanks very much, Gabriella. This has been really really interesting, really useful for sort of sorting out my thoughts on how we actually think about impact. And it kind of comes up along with what Jen was saying, because under our current project, we're doing sort of legal recommendations on freedom of information um, laws. And so what a sort of fear of mine was that if there was no um, policy change or legal change within the actual a uh, time frame of the project which is could be likely seeing as how long these things take but then from what you're saying we could say so activity would be what we've done we've partnered with uh, national organizations uh, to analyze the laws the output being the actual reports and then so the outcome could be then say um activism uh, or, um, was done by national partners using those uh, recommendations so rather than having to try and get uh, an actual change in a policy mm. or, or, or legal framework. Yeah, and thinking about narrative change and narrative influence, because I mean, as any lawyer knows, actually, do you know what I mean? And narrative influence is often the precursor to, to you know, later legal legislative change, right? So seeing when it is picked up, this kind of discourse is picked up in an art, in an article, see when this kind of discourse is picked up in, in a parliamentary discussion on these kinds of things. And so part of it is setting up alerts. The other part of it is, because I mean, that's also what, you know, helping when you think about, when you start using that impact language, it also helps you think about your strategy. Do you know what I mean? So are you sending your the, the research recommendations to the right people? Are you doing a strategic communication campaign to, you know, the, the parliamentary whips if there's a debate coming up? You know, are you targeting 
journalists, you know, are interested in this area of research or parliamentary reporters or these kinds of things. You know, so I do think it, it 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 sometimes helps you think, actually, you know, a little bit more creatively about the strategy of how to get an indication uh, or, or an indicator of your impact, you know, in a confined period. Um, but again, it doesn't have to be perfect. I mean, you know, I find like, <laughs> you know, as um, people working in the social impact space, we are trying to like instill such a level of rigor <laughs> that the people who are doing the damage on the other side <laughs> don't don't apply to their own you know impact monitoring <laughs> you know so i i do encourage us to be you know take you know do you think look at it as a marketing opportunity and not be too ashamed of of doing that as well you know um but yeah is that useful? Sorry. Yes, yes, definitely. Thanks. I'm being very needy, but <laughs> I'm doing that. Sorry. I have a question. <laughs> That's okay. Um, <laughs> so yeah, just had a look at your impact catalogue. That's really cool. Um, what made Thanks. you decide to sort of present it in that way? And how have you found it helpful since? Like, I presume you've been sending it to like funders, etc. Or can you just yeah speak a bit more about how you've actually used that and why you developed it? In that yeah. Way? Um, like everything, it came as an urgent response to you know funding opportunity. Hold on, just my family. Okay, there we go. <laughs> Sorry, they were retrieving the dog who is going to get her nails clipped. Um, so. We actually did it. Um, I was going to present a pitch at the World Summit Awards, and there were there were I knew impact investors in the room, and I was like, can't keep talking about you know our impact and then not having it like on a piece of paper, <laughs> you know. Um, and also, you know, once you have it written down, it becomes true, <laughs> you know, which is another great thing. You know, we talk about all this stuff, and we don't write it down, and we don't communicate it. And but in our brain, we're like, oh, we had that great project in 2012 where we changed lives, you know, but like you need to cement it on paper for it to become true. So we did it in response to that because I knew I was going to be pitching to those kinds of people. Um, but it was such a great exercise, actually. And we're doing a fuller catalog, which will be interactive um, and will also connect the different um impact statements to different like thematics you know what I mean so you can then like sort by SDG or you know sort by whatever because once you again I mean it's like any data story once you put it in a table <laughs> you know like 90% of the work is done now you're just tagging and developing these things you know it's really hard to take for for anybody to take the time to do these things um, which is part of the reason why I know like the impact statement thing seems like such a ephemeral, like it's not real enough, you know, because we've been taught how to do log frames, you know, and with your indicators and your sub indicators and your means of verification and stuff. But like, I think thinking about every project you do, thinking about its highest level impact, whatever you thought that was, you know, and however you phrased it and thinking about a maximum of three points to show that impact from your project is like a really simple way of starting this process. And you know what I mean? If you just log all your projects and do that for each project, I mean, it isn't, it's the start of it is what I'm saying. And it's such a simple way to go about it. And you can do it in a couple of hours. And then, you know, because when you start from that, when you start from the impact side, it's much easier than starting from outputs, the more traditional mole side. And it, it, it focuses on the important part, you know? Um, so that's a, it was a really simple exercise, actually. Um, the tagging is going to get more complicated. Yeah. Can imagine. Yeah. I like the simplicity of it. We've got loads of good content, you know, and like an amazing impact. Yeah in the last 20 years and stuff like that but I don't know if we've ever communicated our 
in fact, in such a simple way. Um, like, in a, yeah. And what's so funny is we often know what the greatest impact of a project is in like one not line ourselves. And it's not necessarily connected, which also goes to show you how bad our mill frameworks actually are. Not necessarily linked to any log frame or whatever. We know what the great story about our projects are in a single line, you know, and we just don't get it down, you know. Mm. Also have an achievements channel. That's very easy. So we have a Slack channel, which is just our achievements channel. Ooh. And then and then that's like whatever anybody thinks is an achievement is. And that's also really interesting because you start to see like, then you start to get like process indicators and stuff like that. Like I didn't punch someone today. No, not really. But like, you know, um, our partner said this great thing about us, you know, or we finally got this partner to do this, you know, which is not... A lot of those organizational development indicators or process indicators we don't reflect on in our own impact monitoring, and they're really, really important because we're not going to get to the impact we want on society when our projects and our collaborations and our organizational development aren't structured to deliver that impact. And we, we often miss those. Um, I've tried many times to try and get funders or uh, to allow us to have sort of organizational development uh, indicators in our objectives. So to say like, not just, you know, uh, we had seven workshops or whatever, but also I generally try and create an objective around like project completion, like, and we've collaborated, we sent this many emails, but they always resist. It's really interesting. And I think to me, it's like such a, missing opportunities so we just reflect on it ourselves but you know it matters yeah